Welcome to the new JFK show number 135. We've got a guest tonight, which we need to do much more often. His name is Mark Shaw. He's just written a book about Dorothy Kilgallen. And um, we're going to go ahead and let him introduce exactly what we're talking about. Tonight, we've got Don Fox, Jim Fetzer, Larry Rivera, and myself, Gary King. And we're really happy to have you, Mark. So, Mark, tell us about your new book. And we've got some images and stuff that we'll be um, playing and we'll discuss as the show goes on. And we're going to go ahead and flip our half-hour hourglass, and it'll keep us on track. All right. Very good. Thanks for having me on the show. Uh, yeah, Dorothy Kilgallen, I've written a book about her called the reporter who knew too much, uh, the mysterious death of uh, what's my line TV star and uh, media icon Dorothy Kilgallen. And uh, this is a book about Dorothy, about the first third is really a tribute to this remarkable woman that we can talk about tonight. And then the last two thirds uh, is an investigation that I've done uh, about how she died uh, unexpectedly in 1965. Um, the book itself has um, uh, all of the in new information, fresh uh, evidence about Dorothy's death, and I'm really proud that this book has um, so many primary sources in it. Uh, I, in my books, this is my 25th book, and I pride myself on primary sources, not a lot of speculation, and uh, as we'll talk about, uh, that's the earmark of this book, the credibility for it. So uh, my main purpose for writing the book uh, is that um, Kilgallen was investigating the JFK assassination, something that I didn't realize when I began looking into her life and death. Um, and in 1965, uh, just as she was about to, as she told friends, crack the case wide open, uh, she was found dead in her uh, townhouse apartment in New York City under very suspicious circumstances. So I wanted to write a book because at that time there was no investigation. Dorothy was denied any justice at that point, and I wanted to make sure uh, that uh, her case was looked at again. And I can tell you uh, good news there that uh, since the book's been out uh, two months now, fifth printing, it's been a book that's just gone through the roof, heard from people all over the world about it, demanding uh, Dorothy get her justice, and I took a chance here, gentlemen, and sent a letter to the New York District Attorney's Office, Cyrus Vance Jr., requesting an investigation. And uh, I was told that the odds of that happening were probably about 50, to one, uh, 50 million to one because the case is 50 years plus old. But uh, we heard uh, from the New York Post in an article a week ago Sunday, a confirmation that the New York District Attorney is looking into Dorothy Kilgallen's death. And that is just great news. And so I've been doing uh, a lot of interviews uh, where I talk about what they're doing, what, uh, where the investigation might go, but especially through uh, people like you, I'm hoping that there may be those out there who were around when Kilgallen was died, uh, when Kilgallen died, who may be able to shed light uh, on her death. And, and if that happens, they can get in touch with me, get in touch with you guys, or get in touch with the DA's office. So we can fill in the blanks, but that basically has been uh, my crusade with this book to get the justice that Dorothy deserves. Well, that's wonderful, uh, Mark. I think that's absolutely splendid. I'm fascinated. I used to watch uh, What's My Line, and it was really stunning how one week she was there, the next week she wasn't there. Never a word of explanation was given at all. I mean, this was a very popular show, hugely, and she was a key participant because of her intelligence and perceptivity. And of course, you've already mentioned what we believe to have been the cause of her death, namely that she let out that she was going to blow the case wide open, which I think was completely inadvisable. And of course, shortly thereafter, her dearest, closest friend in whom she would have expected to have confided also was found dead. So I'm sure that's right. part of your story. Right. So right. Mark, does this most, do you think that it's all because of her talking with Jack Ruby and Jack Ruby telling her too much, or are there other things? Well, let me just tell you guys, uh, take you a little bit on the same journey that I went on with this book, because I, I'd be interested in, in your, uh, you know, your thoughts about how this all came about. Um, as I said, I've written a lot of books, and I uh, began looking into the JFK assassination uh, a number of years ago because... Uh, I wrote a biography of Melvin Belli, 
And I knew Mr. Belli in the 1980s. I'm a former criminal defense lawyer and a legal analyst for some network trials and things like that. But I knew Mr. Belli when I had an office in his building in downtown San Francisco. And um, I chronicled Belli's life. The book was called um, uh, Melvin Belli, King of the Courtroom. And while I was working on that case, gentlemen, um, I learned about Belli's affection for the mafia. You know, he represented the Rolling Stones and Muhammad Ali, but his main client at the time was Mickey Cohen, the Los Angeles gangster. And I really got suspicious of Belli's defense mm. of Jack Ruby. Uh, as you remember, it was this ludicrous uh, psychomotor epilepsy defense. He wouldn't let Ruby testify and all that. So I was really curious about that. And I wrote a little bit about it in that particular book. I then was done with that book and I decided to trace back what I'd learned about Belli's affection for the mafia all the way back to Joe Kennedy and Joe Kennedy's promise to the mafia in 1960 that if they helped him win the 60 election, that the administration would leave those guys alone. Uh, Traficante, uh, Marcello, Giancana, all of them. And as you know, and, and in this next book I wrote called The Poison Patriarch, I, I had an eyewitness who was right there on the night when Joe Kennedy basically ordered JFK to appoint Bobby Kennedy Attorney, Gen Attorney General. And as you know, uh, when the administration took office, Bobby Kennedy went after all those guys, especially Carlos Marcello. So I wrote that book, gentlemen, and I was done. And then there was a quote that I learned when I was working on the Bell Eye book, I could not get out of my mind. And I'm a curious guy like you guys looking for the truth. And here was the quote. I interviewed a uh, doctor friend of Bell Eye's in San Diego. And he said, Mark, you know, Dor uh, Bell Eye knew Dorothy Kilgallen. And I said, well, the, the what's my line star? He said, oh, come on. You don't know about the other part of her life is this crack investigative reporter who covered the Dr. Sam Shepard case and the Lindbergh baby kidnapping case and all these things. And Belli knew her because she covered the Jack Ruby trial. And I said, my gosh, I didn't know about that. He said, well, it's interesting, Mark. When Kilgallen died, I was with Mel. And Mel said to me, listen, they've killed Dorothy. Now they'll go after Ruby. And I could never get that quote out of my mind. And that is the quote that triggered my working on this book and led to my going ahead and, and uh, chronicling uh, Dorothy's life uh, and her death. But we know from what I learned and what's in the book and on the websites uh, that I can mention uh, with the um, videotaped interviews that are there, that from the moment she interviewed Jack Ruby at the trial, and as you said, she's the only one to have done so, she did it twice, on the DorothyKilgallenStory.org, I think you will be fascinated to see a videotaped interview with Joe Tonahill, who explained what, explains what Ruby thought of Dorothy, how the interview took place, where it took place in the courtroom, and what he believes uh, Ruby said to her. So that is verified, that, that she was there, and Joe explains that. So don't, then we go forward, and what did she do next? You, don't, may, you may remember. Don't, don't keep us in suspense, Mark. We want to hear all of this, all of okay, it. Okay, I'm going to get there. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to get there very quickly. So what happened then, as you remember, she exposed Jack Ruby's testimony before the Warren Commission, before its release date. And that's, a, you know, probably similar to the Nixon tapes being revealed, or Snowden, what he did with uh, the CIA or, and the government documents. It was, it was an explosion. And her hairdressers, two of them that we have videotapes from, you'll see them on the same website, the DorothyKilgallenStory.org, talk about the fact that that's when the trouble started. She says to one of them, she's fearful of her, her life and her family. To the other hairdresser, she says, if the wrong people knew what I know about the JFK assassination, it would cost me my life. She took, we don't know exactly what she said to uh, Ruby, uh, only what uh, Tonahill talks about, but she had made one trip to New Orleans. And who was the, the Don in New Orleans? Carlos Marcello, the one that had the motive to get rid of JFK so Bobby Kennedy would be powerless. She went there with the hairdresser. Uh, she was going to go back there. She was writing a book for Random House. She had accumulated all of these, um, all of this fresh evidence. You know, she was the most powerful female voice in America. That's what uh, the New York Post called her. And before uh, she could write that book, uh, there were those who were threatened with exposure, and I believe they are the ones 
who caused the death of Dorothy Kilgallen. Yeah, while we've got it up, can you, um, are you familiar with this uh, a postcard? And could you discuss that for us? Well, I'm glad you sent it because no, I was not. <laughs> I've read it and uh, my, my wife uh, looked at it as well. And we were fascinated with the message. Obviously, the person did not sign their name. No, it was from um, Howard Weisberg. No, no, no. Oh, no, it was, no, it was no. It was the person did not sign. Is it oh. from him or is it to him? No, it was oh, to him. It was it's to him. him. Anonymous. What, what do you know about uh, Harold Weisberg? Oh, yes. He's one of our heroes around here. We, we believe he had it all figured out in the 60s. Well, I didn't. Oh, and I, oh. I didn't know who he was, but he was oh. a stalwart for believing that the Warren Committee, all this stuff was crazy, you know, and everything else. So I'll tell you, one of the things I, I'd like to ask you is, did, did any of you, I mean, you've been involved in this longer than I have, did any of you try to see, I noticed in the obituary that he had a wife, and I think there were a couple uh, children. Did any of you try to follow up to see whether you might locate those people and interview them? His children? Yeah, or his wife. I mean, he died right, in... Right, Lil, no, Lil, Lil, died. Lil also passed away. Lil, Lil passed away also right after him. And his children were never involved. Uh, two in sisters. There's two sisters. Okay, well, yeah, I don't think that he had any children. Uh, well, no, yeah, no, no. What, what he did was he left all his papers at uh, Hood College there in Maryland. Okay. Where, where is that again? Hood College. I have all the information. I'll send you an okay. email uh, with the entire repository address. Yes. And, and a search uh, page also that you can find. Uh, and, and, you know, basically everything that he had, he had uh, 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 filing cabinets full of, of documents. And as you know, he, uh, he was able to pry a lot of uh, JFK related documents and Martin Luther King by the way, uh, via FOIA uh, lawsuits that he enacted against the government, against uh, the National Archives and the government. Uh, but uh, to make a long story short, uh, all of his papers have been scanned and placed in this repository at Hood College, and we're talking about millions of documents. Okay, when well, you I'd like to take a, I'd like to take a look, and I'd like to apologize because I should have known about this person. If you look at that, at that postcard that was sent. Um, it talks right. about the estate of Dorothy Kilgallen. Now, uh, during my research, um, we couldn't find anything really that uh, was included in that estate. Her, I think maybe you may know or you don't know, she had an FBI file, or she had, sorry, she had a JFK assassination file, a thick file with all of her evidence and everything else. That disappeared when she died, when she was found dead uh, in a bedroom in her townhouse right. she never slept in and all of that. So. I don't know. I, I need to know whether there may have been things in this estate that are alluded to uh, in the postcard, and, and I'm going to try to follow up on that. It's a good lead, yeah. Yeah, very good. Very good. Well, well, I'm, I'm sure everything in that file would have implicated Oswald as being the best. <laughs> no, no, no. No, no, no. No, no, no. I'll tell you what, Dorothy. He's sarcastic. He's been sarcastic. If you, if you look at what Dorothy did and you read her articles and columns on, again, the DorothyKilgallenStory.org, she pretty well dismissed Oswald as, as being a person that she could ever figure out. The key for her was Ruby. Right. And that's why she really focused in on him at trial, why she wrote about him, why she um, you know, took whatever advice he had and was looking into what was going on in New Orleans. That was the key figure for her. And I think you'll be amazed at the, you know, you have to understand at the time, of, of course you know, Edgar Hoover was shouting Oswald alone, Oswald alone, Oswald alone. And there was one reporter, Dorothy Kilgallen, who was saying that cra was crazy, along with Mark, uh, her friend Mark. Mark um, and, you know, it's no wonder. I mean, she, she was putting herself in danger because she was the only reporter who was really uh, trying to find out, I believe, the truth of what happened. What? Warren Commission didn't interview her. Jim Garrison didn't interview her. They just dismissed her. And, and people want to know why. And I've told them, everybody thought about her like I did. She was the What's My Line game show person, so how could she be credible about this? And so I think that's why everybody, including all of the authors who have written these terrible books since then, never even mention her in the book. I want to so, hear, uh, hear what you have sorted out about her and her findings and her sure. trip to New Orleans and all that, Mark. Well, I think that she, from what I've gathered, and, and again, primary sources, she had gone ahead and connected uh, Ruby and, and, uh, and Marcello. 
and and that's not a stretch uh, because of course Ruby was the mafioso who uh, uh, you know kind of want to be mafioso in Dallas with his nightclub and uh, uh, Marcello who had the greatest movie motive to get rid of JFK so Bobby would be powerless his kingdom uh, stretched over to Dallas I think she had connected them and that was the most important thing to her when she went to New Orleans the first time uh, we don't know exactly who she met with, but a hairdresser went with her. And uh, you'll hear him in this video, in one of these videos that I found, say, while they were there, she called him and said, go back to New York. Uh, there's a ticket for you. Don't tell anybody you were here, and don't ask any questions about her. And this is just a few weeks before she died. So we know that that happened, and we know that she was writing this book for Random House. We know that she showed a chapter or two to, to Bennett Cerf, who was her colleague on What's My Line uh, and the co-founder of Random House. So we know that that happened. And then we also know that she had been sharing some secrets. I mean, I think you gentlemen should know that in the book, it's, it's kind of like a set up as a true crime murder mystery, but there is one suspect at the end of the book who is really pointed at. And right at the end of her life, a, a journalist in, in Ohio named Ron Pataki had become very uh, well acquainted with uh, Kilgallen in a romantic way. She was sharing information with him about her JFK assassination. He had a dubious background with a lot of violence and some mafia connections. And then you go and you look at the, at the night before she died. Uh, she was on her last uh, What's My Line program. After that, she left and had a drink with a, with a producer there at a nightclub in, uh, in New York City. She went, just went then to the, the Regency Hotel bar, and we have an eyewitness again video, a uh, videotaped eyewitness who says that she saw, uh, she was a contestant on What's My Line that night, she saw Kilgallen with a man in a corner talking to him in a very serious way. And we believe that man was Ron Pataki. Within a few hours, Kilgallen was uh, found in her townhouse apartment in a bedroom she never slept in, wearing her eyelashes, her um, hairpiece, and her makeup that she never wore to bed, wearing clothes she never wore to bed. Uh, the body was found by the hairdresser at about 9 o'clock, and it's a chilling interview with him where you'll hear him talk about that. And, but the authorities never got there until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. We don't know exactly what happened to her body by then. Uh, very suspicious was the fact that they didn't call the Manhattan, D, uh, Manhattan Medical Examiner's Office, but they called the Brooklyn, Manhattan, uh, Brooklyn ME's office. And I have eyewitnesses who were there who talk about the mafia control of the ME office at that time. The uh, medical examiner came from there. He conducted an autopsy and immediately said that she had died accidentally. And the exact wording was she died of a combination of bar barbiturates and alcohol. And then after a colon, he wrote, circumstances undetermined. Despite that finding, there was absolutely no investigation. They decided there was an empty secondol bottle uh, beside the bed and that she must have overdosed some way or another or accidentally died. No investigation of any kind despite a staged, what appeared to be at least a staged death scene. And so that's what happened to Dorothy. And gentlemen, she disappeared from the face of the earth. I mean, murder is the worst form of censorship and this is what happened to Dorothy. All of her, her, her file was dis had disappeared. Uh, nobody ever checked any of her columns. All of these authors who have written uh, books about the JFK assassination never even mention her. So it's, in, it, it, it's just a, a tragedy in, in a distortion of history in many ways because Kilgallen, until now, has never been part of the equation. And I can tell you, I have heard from people all over the world after the New York Post uh, wrote this article um, about uh, the DA investigating who have come forward and said, Wow, we, have, we had no idea what Dorothy Kilgallen was all about and what she had found about the JFK assassination. So what do I think would have happened? I'll finish with this. I believe that if she would have been able to write that book and include all of the evidence I'm talking about through the best sources, because she was the queen of the reporters, that she would have published her book or she would have written articles that would have implicated J. Edgar, Hoover, J. Edgar Hoover for covering up the investigation uh, of, of JFK's death 
by shouting the Oswald stuff. She would have had uh, Carlos Marcello indicted. She would have been able to present all of this evidence and there would have been that grand jury investigation and all of her evidence would have come out. I think that's what would have happened if she would have been permitted to live. But justice was denied to Dorothy Kilgallen and uh, I'm intent on fighting for her voice to be heard again. Well, Mark, that's all very, very uh, commendable. Right. I, I appreciate you think Carlos Marcello was the key, but there were a whole lot of other players involved here, including the CIA, the Joint Chiefs, the anti-Castro Cubans, the, the, the Texas oilmen, and uh, the Eastern establishment surrounding the Fed and Israel. This was a very big deal. It was not simply a mafia hit. But I want to know what you found, because it may be extremely illuminating about this aspect of the puzzle. I really think the best thing to do is for me to read whatever book you want me to read, and you read my book about Dorothy, and I will send you one as I Mark, offer to Mark, do Mark, so. Mark, Mark, Mark. We got you on here now. I wanted to have you on. I'm very impressed sure. that your book is doing so well. I think it's fantastic. You never know what's going to you know, tickle the public's interest to take a serious look at at JFK, and you may have done something extremely important. So just share with us what you found. I, I believe I have. I, you know, Dorothy, Dorothy had honed, Dorothy is the only reporter to have, rep, to have interviewed Jack Ruby. And where did she go after that? She went to New Orleans. She didn't go to Washington. She didn't go anywhere else. She went to, uh, she went to New Orleans. And uh, there's, there's a primary source in the book that talks about the fact that she was honing in on Carlos Marcello. And you, it, it's not a stretch to believe because that's what Ruby had talked to her about. And so that's where she was going. That's what she was doing. And she was making a second trip to New Orleans. And I believe uh, if, 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 in fact, her, her file had not been um, had not been destroyed and she had not been murdered, that that's what she would have wrote about, uh, written about. That, that's the best I can really do, Jim. I'm sorry. I, I, well, I just me, you have to read the book and kind of see where it goes. Let me give you a little background here, Mark, so you have a, some appreciation where I'm coming from. There are 15 indications of Secret Service complicity in setting them up for the hit. Carlos Marcello could not have been responsible for any of those including that the driver, William Greer, pulled the limousine to the left and to a halt to make sure JFK would be killed. The, the, the autopsy, the body was taken forcibly from Parkland Hospital. It was put into a bronze casket, but removed, it appears, on the plane en route to Washington, D.C., removed in a body bag, transported by helicopter to Walter Reed, where the best medical pathologists in the military removed bullet fragments before the body was sent over to the to the Bethesda in a in a black ambulance, while the Gray Navy ambulance with Jackie Kennedy and a huge entourage was pulling up in front of Bethesda already. Gerald Custer, who took the X-rays at JFK, was proceeding upstairs in the company of two Secret Service agents to develop X-rays because the autopsy was already undergoing. They altered the autopsy X-rays to conceal a massive blowout at the back of the head. They had a 6.5 millimeter metallic slice to another and where the brain shown in the diagrams and photographs in the National Archives cannot possibly be the brain of John F. Kennedy, who had half his brains blown out in Dealey Plaza because it's a full, virtually intact brain. I mean, these are just sketching a couple of points, which, alas, Harold Weisberg was unaware, so Gary overstated. What he meant was Harold Weisberg was on the right track. But there's a whole mass of new technology scientific research that's been applied to the case that goes far beyond what would have been available to Dorothy Kilgallen or it would appear to you. We're just fascinated by what you've done. I think that you've got a book that's in a fifth printing is stunning. O only I, I have two books that were, or three books that were in a second printing even. So yeah, that's what I was going to say. How can, how can a Dorothy Kilgallen book be that popular in 2017? I mean, props out to Mark. You know. Yeah, that's amazing. I'll tell, tell you. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. You know, I never knew about Dorothy, guys. I mean, you have to understand. She was. This was back in an era when people actually got their news from the newspaper. The the TV was in its infancy. There was no internet of any kind, and um, you know. So 
it, she was syndicated to 200 newspapers across the country every single day. She covered these uh, most famous trials at the time. If you go to the website that I mentioned, you'll see a photograph of her at the, um, at the Dr. Sam Shepard case. And she's surrounded by all of the other reporters. Uh, she was a media icon in that she had a radio program every day. She raised three kids during this time. I mean, a remarkable woman. And so she was the most, the most powerful. Called her Sorry. the most powerful female voice in America. So what people, I'm getting to your, your question. When people read the first third of this book, they didn't know all this, just like I didn't, and I doubt that you guys did. She was just a re remarkable woman. And so I think when they do read the, the evidence that I have, the forensic evidence, the primary witnesses uh, that, are, that are quoted in the book, they are disturbed by what happened to her. Now, some people have said, hey, who cares about a case that's 50 years old? Well, guys, murder is murder whether it happens five days ago or 50 years ago, she's a victim, she has rights. And, and that's what I think has triggered the New York District Attorney's Office investigating a case that's 50 years old. People have just been fascinated with this. I've had emails where people have gone to the cemetery to her grave and, and uh, prayed for her, calling her a patriot for what she was trying to do with the JFK assassination. It, I can't explain it exactly. I never thought this would happen. But no. it's just, it, it, I was on coast to coast the other night, okay? Uh, since that, uh, let's see, that was night last night or night before last. I was on that program, okay, with George Norrie. Uh, I had at least 100 emails the, the, the next morning from people all over the country worried about, you know, uh, what happened to Kilgallen and all of that. Somehow or another, it has struck a nerve because it's that justice denied um, part of, 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 the, of what's going on in, in our country these days, this justice denied theme that I know bothers you guys too when that happens. So I think that's the reason why the book has taken off like it is. And I will tell you this as well. We've made a deal with a motion picture com company in Los Angeles, a very well-known one. To, to produce a feature film about Dorothy's life, including all of this information that I've given you. So all I ask, I'm, I'm going to keep an open mind with what you've said. I'm going to find one of Jim's books to read. I just ask that you keep an open mind about what I've discovered. Yeah, with that, Dorothy. yeah that's, that's very fair. We, we are 100% open to what you're saying, Mark. Uh, why, why would you think we're not? It's just that you're presuming that you have the whole explanation when it's just a bit more complicated. But well, you've done something sensational. You found an angle and you've got an audience that's responsive, and you have the potential to re re reawaken interest in the case, and I congratulate yeah. you. For that. I, I am in complete awe and admiration of what you've done. Don't misunderstand. Yeah. Well, yeah. We have been at this for, I began research, on, serious research on JFK in 1992. And, and you know, we have done a huge amount here. And this sure. is actually, this, this group is the cutting edge of contemporary JFK research. And that's why I wanted to have you in. And I'm very pleased you're here. And I yeah. want to give Don and, and, and Larry and Gary the opportunity to ask you questions. But well, Let me apologize, first of all. As you can tell, I get pretty passionate about this and too passionate well, here. So I apologize for that. Well, that's no we, problem, Mark. No, we no, Mark, you're fantastic. I, just don't... Well, that's all we all are here because yeah, it's, it's amazing the amount of success that you've had. Now, there is an angle that uh, you may not be familiar with that we've uncovered recently, and uh, a colleague of ours named Rouse and Kay has done some extensive research, and it appears to us that it actually wasn't Jack Ruby that in the famous murder on television of Lee Oswald. Now, th I know that seems a little far-fetched, but we've really, really looked into it hard. And we've speculated, which um, I can promise you one thing. Once Larry reads this book, he's going to be able to suck out all of the pertinent things. And so what we're saying is we believe that Jack Ruby told Dorothy that I'm not even the one that shot him. You see, oh. we feel it was choreographed. And wow. once once you watch it really close, you can actually see that's them throw a bag over his head and throw him in. You want to elaborate, Larry? That's a great point. I, I didn't think about it that way. You know, I, I'm glad you brought it up, buddy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what, what do you think, Jim? 
Well, I want to hear what what Dor- what Dorothy learned from Jack that Mark has reported. That's the key part of. Yeah, but, but what Gary is surmising, okay, let's not call it speculation, that uh, maybe uh, Jack told her that it wasn't really him. Well, this is what I want to ask Mark. Yeah. Okay. Let's go for it. We're coming from an independent, a study, a forensic study of the photographic evidence, and this appears to be an FBI agent by the name of Bookout. Yeah, uh, it, and it's fascinating. Did did she know that Lee wasn't wasn't? Well, you say she dismissed him as the shooter, but did she realize he was actually standing in the doorway watching the motorcade when it passed by? A couple things there. First of all, she just nothing I can find really deals too much with Oswald. She just focused on uh, Ruby. I find what you're saying. You know, you could be right about the fact that that it, that it, that it wasn't Ruby who who shot Oswald because. I wish, uh, and, I, and I can't, because uh, when she died, that investigation file of hers was missing. Right. So all you can do then is trace uh, what she did when she talked to Ruby and where she went and what she told people and all of that. That's the best I can do, and it's, and but, it's, not, it's not as good as I'd like for it to but be. But needless to say, Mark, if she thought Marcello was the key and went to New Orleans to see Marcello, she was putting herself on the hot seat. I mean, if this guy thinks he's been exposed that he was the key to taking out the 35th president, she's not going to have a long life. I infer from what you've been telling us that this guy put Chacky whatever is the one who actually did her in, did the right, talking right. of her apartment, took all the records because he had inside information and he knew she had a friend and he took care of her too. That would be my inference from what you've said so far. Uh, Jim, I, I wanted to uh, mention a couple of things. Uh, you have brought up uh, the Marcello Ruby connection. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's what uh, Judith uh, Barry Baker tells us in her book. Right. How, how close that Marcello and Ruby were. Well, she and she and Lee went down, and and, and, and Jack introduced them to Carlos Marcello. They used to wow. party with Jim. They used to party with Marcello. With Mar- I know, wow. which was quite, although right. we didn't know it at the time, part of setting up Lee for the role of the Patsy. But that's he actually did. Book. He worked for him. He worked for Carlos yeah, I think Marcello. I, I think I knew that. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And and a couple of other things that, that I I really wanted to uh, ask you, Mark. Uh, Carrie Comer, her, her son, whatever happened with him, he was really involved in the early investigation in the late 70s uh, of, of her death. Can you tell us uh, anything about it, whatever you know about, about that? Well, one thing I did want to mention about the uh, postcard that you sent, if you, know, if you look at the uh, date on there, it's 1975. And uh, I, I put in the book that uh, in 1975, the FBI contacted Dorothy trying to see if he knew where her JFK assassination file was. You're talking about Kerry? Yeah, so I found that to be quite interesting. As far right. as Kerry goes, he is quite a, a, a significant part of Dorothy looking into JFK's death. Uh, he was her youngest son, and he took, she took him to the White House, and JFK, who was a friend of hers from social things, was so nice to Kerry. Uh, in the library, he walked in and, and made a fuss over uh, Kerry uh, and looked at some letters he brought from the third grade class and all of that. And so when Dorothy died, there's a quote in the book that I use that she put in one of her columns, uh, something to the effect, um, the man, uh, what I remember is a tall man stooping over a little boy looking at the letters he brought from, him, uh, from uh, his third grade class. This is the man who was assassinated in Dallas. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, Bennett Cerf said of Dorothy, when she went after a case, nothing could stop her. And that's really what happened uh, with the JFK assassination uh, because of that link uh, with Carrie. Now, uh, I believe Lee Israel talks about Carrie also uh, trying to, to see if he could find out what happened to this investigation file. Right. Richard Calmer, who is Dorothy's, uh, was Dorothy's husband at the time, who had fallen on hard times and had some alcoholic problems and everything, after Dorothy died, said that he destroyed it, that it had caused enough damage and he got rid of it and everything. I'm, I'm very suspicious of that happening. But yes, you are exactly right. Dor- uh, Carrie, at one point, tried to get uh, information about that file, and then in turn, in 1975, the FBI uh, tried to... Um, uh, see if he had found any information about the file. 
Okay. Uh, I, I should tell you, because you're probably curious, did the uh, children cooperate with me with the book? Uh, right. No, they did not. I contacted Jill, uh, who was the one daughter. I told her I was writing the book. I asked her if she wanted to uh, permit me to interview her. Uh, she said at that time that she didn't want to, and I'll tell you why I think she didn't. But I said, I'll, t I'll, I'll do this for you. I will send you the manuscript I have written. And if you and your brothers disagree with what I've written, I will not publish the book. Let me know if you want it. And I did not hear back from her. Wow. I think the problem with the kids is this. During the end of, the, end, end of Dorothy's life, you know, uh, she was having a tough time. And, and then they said that she died of an alcohol uh, and, and barbiturate combination. Uh, that didn't do much for their, for their uh, feeling about their mom. They, they may have believed some of that. And then Richard committed suicide just two or three years later. Wow. So they didn't have a lot of great memories with the, uh, with the parents. And I think that, that's one of the reasons uh, that they have stayed out of this. Are you aware yeah. why, why Richard committed suicide? Well, um, he, he had had a tough time. It, it was not easy, of course, being Mr. Dorothy Kilgallen, which <clears> is what he was in some ways. He had a Broadway career. Uh, and, and produced a couple plays. Uh, they didn't go as well as he thought they would. He opened three or four restaurants. They didn't go very far. And finally, he really did have some alcoholic problems. And, and what's sad about that, I may tell you, uh, all of you will remember the Edward R. Murrow person-to-person -person program. And I found some footage, which is also up on the Dorothy Kilgallen story.org, of an interview that, uh, that uh, Murrow did with the family. And in 1956, you will see Dorothy and Richard with two of the kids, uh, Jill and Carrie, and they're just the happiest family. And it's really unfortunate that less than 10 years later, um, everything had disintegrated uh, in the family. Dorothy uh, dies, and then Richard commits suicide, I think, based on the fact that his, just, his life was just uh, a mess for him. Ooh, yeah, Mark. Wow. Um, yeah, I thought... Yes. I've read in the past, Mark, you can confirm that Dorothy was, you know, not very successful in her r relationships with men. And it would seem as though that extends beyond her husband to this fellow she was involved with, who I presume was the, the source of her death. So, you know, that she really wasn't good. <laughs> well, I, I don't know where you've read that, but, but I, again, would ask, you know, that you, you read the book because I, I don't believe that's accurate. Uh, she had a great marriage with Richard for, I don't know how many years, but many years, maybe 20. She fell in love with, uh, you guys will remember, Johnny Ray, the singer, uh, who was thought to be a, you know, a, 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 a homosexual, but actually was a bisexual. She had a wonderful love affair with him and then became great friends. And even with Pataki, she had a, a, a terrific relationship with him. She just was suspicious of him at the end of leaking some of her investigation. And those are the only men that were ever in her life. How long was that uh, relationship with Pataki, do you know? Well, he kind of conveniently came into her life, great question, came into her life just as she was really getting into the JFK assassination. You Had her on a movie junket. And, yeah. um, you know, uh, in, in the book you will see that we believe uh, her drink was poisoned uh, at, at uh, either the Regency Hotel or in her home. There were actually the autopsy that's in the book. There wasn't one barbiturate that killed her. There were three. And uh, Dr. Michael Baden is one of those that later looked at the results of her, uh, some, uh, some samples of her uh, liquids that were in her body and, and surmised that she had been murdered. Uh, there were a couple other toxicologists that I interviewed who are still alive that believe that. And we believe that Pataki uh, either is the one who poisoned her drinks uh, one of her drinks, or knows who did. And one of the things you, you asked me was about, um, you know, why I think the DA got involved. And uh, I believe that one of the reasons is because Pataki is still alive, 81, and living in Ohio. And he wrote two poems that you'll find fascinating, uh, both of which seem to um, really point towards his involvement some way uh, with Dorothy's death. And, and one of them has a little image of a bartender. And at the top, the, uh, the, the poem is named Vodka Roulette, seem, seen as a relief possibility. And the, two, the, the four stanzas are, while I'm sl spilling my guts, she is driving me nuts. Please fetch us two drinks on the run. 
just skip all the poison, make, yes, just skip all the poison, make another one of them poison, and don't even tell me which one. Now, he told me in my interviews, these are just humorous poems. But anybody who really looks at them um, can tell that there, there's little doubt that they, they relate to uh, Kilgallen. So do you I think imagine, that's another reason the DA has looked into the case. Do you imagine they had to undress and redress her because she threw up on her clothing and it would have been forensically significant in terms of the cause of death? The, death, the, the dress, uh, Jim, that she wore to What's My Line that, that night has never been found. And boy, that would go right along with what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're looking at some uh, uh, documents right now that are, you know, just really uh, amazing, uh, where the FBI and the CIA were totally after her and completely interested in, in what and with who and what she was talking about regarding the JFK assassination, especially Tona Hill. And, uh, and and what she was yeah, doing in Dallas. Right there. Look at that. Well, yeah, at one point she spent the whole month in Dallas in February and March of 1964. You know, so, uh, you know, she was really, really involved in, in uh, investigation there. Bear in mind, Mark, we have no doubt that the mob was involved, had a powerful reason. It's just that they weren't the primary or sole perpetrators of this most complicated murder mystery in history. Yeah, well, certainly a lot of things went on in New Orleans. There's no doubt about that. So she was definitely in the right town to be figuring out what all was going on. Yeah. What, and, what, uh, what, what about what about her father, James? Uh, I, I understand that uh, he sort of like, because uh, he was also a crack reporter as well. Oh, yes. And, 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 and he sort of like uh, totally went into a shell after, the, after she was assassinated. Well, I, t I will tell you this, and, and, and this uh, speaks to my, my passion, and again, I apologize for, for some of it. Um, nobody stood up for Dorothy. You know, guys, uh, it's still that way today. You hear something bad about somebody, and we all, we all, for some reason, we always want to think the worst. Well, uh, when, the, when, the, when the medical examiner said she died of a, a drug, uh, you know, accidental uh, overdose of drugs and alcohol. Everybody thought she was a druggie and an alcoholic, for God's sakes. Yeah, and right, nobody right. stood up for her. There was right. no evidence of her having a drug problem or being an alcoholic. But everybody just said, okay, well, fine. I guess that's what happened. Um, no friends, no people at What's My Line, none right, of her right. journalist colleagues, and right. especially her family. Hey, and Mark. Jim yeah. and May, her husband, her, uh, her parents, and the kids, and here's why, okay? And the two hairdressers um, on, on these videos will say why. They were all scared. They knew she was investigating the JFK assassination, and if, if powerful forces could kill the President of the United States, then they believed those same powerful forces had killed Dorothy. Sure. And so were they going to speak up? No. In fact, one of the hairdressers never gave an interview, which we have on this site, until 1999. Yeah, what's the name and of the your site, Mark? the interviewer asked him, one more thing, the interviewer asked him why he never spoke up, and he said, well, I was scared. And the interview, interviewer says, well, are you scared now? And he says, yes. As well, he should be, actually. And, and, and yeah, I, Mark. I wanted to add, I wanted to add that, uh, and I want to ask you, Mark, uh, because we know this is part of the entire JFK situation with the mass media. Uh, perhaps uh, this was a, a way of uh, showing the media who was in control and uh, shot across across the bow. You oh, know, don't wow. get involved. Don't get involved in this because this is exactly what happened to you, which wow, is exactly what happened to Gus. Terrific. Yeah, to Gus Grissom and Ed White, especially Gus Gris Grissom, right, Jim? Because uh, uh, he was going to blow the whole, uh, you know. Right. Uh, a so, moon they, hoax. so they dry roasted him in a right, right, in an absolute accident. Which, which brought, yeah, which, which brought all the other, and, yeah, which brought all the other astronauts in line. You know, so this is the same mo as far as I'm that's concerned. A, that's a terrific comment yeah, because yeah, Mark, quickly, the yeah, and that's going to make everybody else stop and think. The yeah, Mark, let's Gallen go to your story. website real quick. Yeah, the Dorothy Kilgallen story. The, the, org. The D O R T H. Now you got to put another O in there. Uh oh. Okay. <laughs> the D O R T H O R Y. Okay, I'm just going to throw this out there. Okay, my my take on it is that Hill Gallon was talking to Ruby, and as we've been breaking down in the last couple of months here, Ruby did not actually shoot Oswald. Wow. 
Um, and it, we, you can tell by the photos because okay, you watch every film you, you want to of that, you never see the shooter's face. And there's a big wow. scrum. The whole thing is, you know, we've watched it, you know, 50 yeah, It's coming times. apart. Yeah, that story is coming apart. Though. And it, it, wow. it appears to be very choreographed, just as, just as the assassination was, where the limo was at a very low speed, and then it came to a complete stop, and then they blew Kennedy's brains out, and then it moved on to the hospital at a regular kind of a jaunt. It, they did not and, – and the execution of, of Oswald was the same way totally choreographed and scripted and okay i think that's what kill gallon was probably getting on to well i'm going to look into more of that and see if i can yeah that's a great, those are great observations and, 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 yeah, and, what, and who hold on uh, now and who was jack rubenstein okay, <laughs> I, I, i'm 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 convinced he was working for the mossad oh. as, part of, as part of the lansky oh. The Meyer Lansky Crime Syndicate. You knew, of course, he was an investigator for the House Un American Activities Committee working for Richard Nixon, right? Yeah. I did not. And he was an informant for the FBI, et cetera, et cetera. He was running. He, in, was, in, he was the local arrangements chairman for the event in Dallas. I mean, his, uh -huh. the, the number of phone calls to Jack Ruby just skyrocketed in the weekend. Yeah, I didn't know that. Assassination. Yeah, yeah, and Mark, to, I think you would be most interested if you could go to video on the site. Uh, have, you ever, ask you to do that. have you ever seen the video of Dorothy with Belli and Tana Hill at a news conference? No, no we have not. But we can play it now. Yeah, we can. Uh, Jack Ruby news conference, press conference. There, <laughs> right there. You, 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 know, you know that Jack Ruby introduced Lee Oswald, his friend from the CIA, to Beverly. To Beverly Oswald. Right yeah, at the Carousel Club. Uh, I think you just. Yeah, I think. Yeah, hit that. Yeah. Okay. Click that. Click that. This is great. Turn up the volume. If you... We've had. Uh, yes, she is. We decided we didn't want those uh, who saw it. I think they saw some, some very uh, important things. Now, prospectively, uh, here in Dallas, and away from Dallas, uh, when we are moved, we may have to take some who have seen it uh, on TV, not because they're qualified, but because eventually we want to get to trial. But uh, we're not going to go to trial here unless we're forced to trial with witnesses who saw this on TV. How long does the person have to live in Dallas County to be a prospective juror? What are the rest yeah, and the state took much into county. Is there any chance that you might get a transplant to Chicago or New York or someone from another state? Just had one. Just had one. We sat in the jury up in uh, New York. The one, that we, the one we challenged the trial to keep from being disbarred. <laughs> <laughs> I first moved from the New York Central for the time, I guess, uh, reading in an American court up in uh, Ohio. Uh, the true serum, the thalamine, or any of those drugs that have been used. We've had uh, not jurors, but any fact uh, finders. Now, whether it's a juror or a witness, uh, we have used uh, hypnosis, we have used polygraph, we have used the so called true serum. And indeed, there's a Cornell and Superior Court out of uh, California that came down from our Supreme Court where they allowed, uh, and indeed, there was a mandate the California Supreme Court. San Diego County, that the lawyer be allowed to take it. Just a minute. If I may allude to that. Now, I also think if uh, I think this is just about done, if you would go to the uh, videos again. Just to go to the video section again. Oops. There okay. she is whispering in his ear. So we'll go back to video. Right, and uh, go to Joe Tonahill. Joe Tonahill, there we go. Uh, no, uh, you didn't quite hit there. Yeah, Joe Tonahill, right there, please. Okay. Kind of these are four, four excerpts from a much longer uh, interview, but. Um, I think you click on the video. Yeah, you got it right now. You got okay. it right here. right here. They are. This one here first. You can hit whatever you want to. First impression of Dorothy by Ruby. 
uh, I think Jack was highly impressed with uh, Dorothy Kilgallen. And uh, he figured she was a very classy person. She had good program. Uh, watched my line, and she was a highly intelligent person. And uh, I think that of, of all the writers that were down there, during the Ruby trial, about 400 from all over the world, uh, she probably was the, the one that, to him, was the most significant. So she was in the entertainment business. She had a strip joint, and, and uh, he looked upon her as someone that may be able to help him. He, well, he was trying to get help from everybody he could that had uh, any significant standing in the community or anywhere else. He was a name dropper, you know. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay, now the next one. The next one is uh, he'll tell you how the uh, if if you want to look at it, the next one is he'll tell you how uh, Kilgallen came to interview Ruby. Right there. She told me that she had had a contact with a friend of Jack's from San Francisco. I believe it was an opera singer that he was very fond of, and. She wanted to pass along a message to him. And I told Jack that, and he said, yeah, I'd like to talk with her. And uh, I told the four guards, Jack had a, a bodyguard shield around him of four deputy sheriffs sitting there behind him, you know, and everywhere he went. And I told them and uh, that uh, she wanted to ask Jack some questions and speak with him at recess, and that he had agreed to it, and they said, okay. So at the... Uh, when, when the judge declared the noon recess, uh, Jack went over and spoke with it. I see. Where did they talk? Was it in the hallway? No, it was in the courtroom right behind his chair where he was sitting. There was a rail there, and he got up and went to the – she was on the other side of the rail. Jack was on this side, and they had a little conversation. I think the press had already left the courtroom at that time. I see. Approximately how long did they talk in private? About five minutes. I see. In the book by Lee Israel, it, it says eight minutes, but something. Yeah, I say about more or less. Approximately. Okay. And do you, did you hear anything they said that was important? She started out, no, no. She started out mentioning the fact that this opera singer in, in, corporate, in San Francisco and I uh, had spoken with her about Jack, and she wanted to tell him, so I, I didn't pay him much attention to what they were saying. Do you know the name of the opera singer? No. Or So we don't know if the opera singer is still alive. No. Uh, I see. And uh, did this opera singer ever turn up at another time in the trial? No, but Jack was very enthusiastic about her, so they must have been pretty close friends. Yeah, she was one of the most powerful women next to, it was like, almost like Jim Garrison. He was um, the most powerful legal person, and she seemed to be the most powerful reporter in the country to have on your side. Sure you wish. Play, yeah, play yeah. the next one. Yeah. Pull it back up, Gary. It slipped on the screen. Because you, you need to start that one again. You'll understand what he's talking about then. Yeah. He wasn't uttering nonsense uh, because this interview with her was a very significant point in his uh, classless life. You know? <laughs> I think he enjoyed it very much and cooperated with her in every way that he could and uh, told her the truth as uh, he understood it. And, and it was just a uh, a very agreeable uh, conversation between them. And I, I, just, I just can't understand people uh, doubting the uh, sincerity of that interview because it was, to me, I watched them and it was a very sincere discussion going back and forth. Mark, based upon your research, what did Jack Ruby tell Cor Dorothy Kilgallen? Yeah. <laughs> How I wish uh, Joe Tonahill would have listened. No, uh, Gary, you've gone too far. It's the fourth one. Yeah, it's a it's a one, it's a one yeah. above it, isn't it? No, oh, you miss a, you missed another one. You missed a. I don't know why Earl Ruby would make that statement. Did we watch it already? No. Bill Decker, the sheriff, knew about the interview. 
Decker was involved in the assassination, Mark, just for you. Yeah, of course. What I told him. What he's saying here is that Earl Ruby said the interview never took place, and he's saying he got approval from Decker. So that may be interesting in terms of what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. Well, we okay. think what you're doing is sensational, Mark. Don't have any misunderstanding. We think it's what you're doing is simply superb. <laughs> Gary, you have let the slide, you've let the screen slip down. There we go. She wasn't struggling with any substance abuse and she wasn't using any. I went to dinner with her in New York at the 21 Club. She didn't, uh, I think she may have had one vodka tonic and that was about it. And uh, she didn't show any indication of being an alcoholic to me the times I was around her or any drug use either. She had a good mind, and her mind was working, and working very realistically and very effectively. Wow. Now, Gary, that's the second hourglass, right? You've already flipped it, right? Yeah, it sure is. Yeah, yeah. sands of time are running low. So, Mark, 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 tell us more about what you'd want us to understand about your work. We're very impressed. Mark. Well, Mark, Mark. I appreciate that, and, and I respect what you guys are doing as well. I do want to try to answer your question. I wish Joe Tonahill had listened. He didn't. Here's the problem with Dorothy, and, and it's why we don't know exactly what happened uh, in terms of what Ruby told her. Um, when she exposed Ruby's testimony before the Warren Commission, uh, Hoover was uh, just uh, as angry as could be, and they came to interview her. They wanted her to tell them the source of who gave her that, and she said, I'd rather die than give you my sources. So she kept everything inside of her. Mark Lane may have known, but uh, I, uh, other than that, nobody. So she wrote a column about interviewing Ruby, and she didn't really give too much in there. She said he was nervous, he was scared. It's in, it's, it's up here on this site too. And um, then she said, uh, I walked out of the uh, uh, courtroom not knowing what I really thought about this man. And you can take interpretations from that as well. But then she never wrote anything else about it in terms of what he said. She never told anybody else because again, she was a woman who protected her sources. So I wish I could answer that question for you. But, but, but why did she say she was going to blow the case out of the water? What justified her in saying that? I think she really felt like that, um, you know, she had landed on Ruby and that Ruby was the key. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we don't want to speculate, but from what she told uh you know, her, her uh, you know, that, that whole uh, speech that she gave to her hairdresser, if the wrong people knew what I know about the JFK assassination, it would cost me my life. You, you have to believe for sure that she felt like she had um, put the pieces of the puzzle together. Well, well Mark, she was very... Pieces are, but it's, it's just not something I can do. Well, how well connected could she have been if she had been, uh, she was invited uh, into the judge's chambers, you know, I mean, how close can you get uh, in, in the Ruby trial, you know, in something like that? Oh, yeah. I mean, they, he invited, Joe Brown invited her in for an autograph, you know. Uh, she was a celebrity. You can, you, you can imagine why Ruby was so enamored with her and trusted her uh, with, with what he had to, uh, with what he had to say. How much time we got, Gary? I was just about running out. We got maybe a minute or so. So, Mark, um, Mark, I want you to know we'd love to get you back here again sometime. I think among the books time is up. To look at is Dr. Mary's Monkey by Ed Haslam and yes. Judith Barry Baker's book, uh, Me and Lee. Uh, uh -huh. I think you'd find those valuable about what was going on in New Orleans at the time. Okay. May I send you a book? Sure. Uh, okay. Can I get one too? Somebody give me an address. Yeah, we'll give you. We'll get. We'll give it by email. You'll get yeah, it by email. Just send me an email, and I'll get you some books. Yeah. All right, well, fellas. All right, all right. With me. <laughs> I have a new JFK book that'll appear next month, and I'll send you a copy of that. Please, thank I, you so much. All right. Well, it looks like we've got work to do. We've got to read Mark's book. Mark's going to read some of our books, and we're going to have a better understanding about our 35th president of the United States, Mark Shaw. We want to appreciate you being on the JFK show number 30, 135, and we'd love to have you back again. And we love you, brother. Talk Thank to you, you later so on. I love you guys. Thanks a lot, Don, Good. Jim, Larry. We'll see you next week. Good night, Mark. I already sent you that stuff uh, that I promised. Oh, thank you.
coup d'etat in slow motion. Connecting the dots between the assassinations of Swedish Prime Minister Olaf Palme, JFK, Robert Kennedy, and John Lennon. Now available on Amazon and lightonconspiracies.com. Coup d'etat in slow motion.